Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Maski, and today we're having a look at a curious and rather dubious 19th century meteorological instrument. This is called a Fitzroy storm glass. And unfortunately, the actual inventor of this device and how they came up with the design in the first place has been lost to history, though examples of this kind of instrument are known to have been manufactured in France, Italy, and Germany as early as the 1840s. However, the modern name of this instrument comes from the man who first popularized its use in the 1860s, Vice Admiral Robert Fitzroy of the Royal Navy. And if that name sounds familiar, that's because Fitzroy was the captain of HMS Beagle during its famous second voyage of 1831 to 1836, during which he chose as his traveling companion and ship's naturalist, a young Charles Darwin. Now, Fitzroy retired from active naval service in 1850, mostly due to ill health, and in 1851 was elected to the Royal Society, thanks in large part to the recommendation of Charles Darwin. And in 1853, he was appointed meteorological status or status to the Board of Trade, in which he presided over a newly formed organization that would eventually become the Meteorological Office or Met Office. And it is in this position that Fitzroy did some of the most important and influential work of his career. You see, up until this point, sailors had mostly used a variety of folk methods to predict the weather, such as observing the behavior of animals or various atmospheric signs, such as the classic red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in morning, sailor take warning. But Fitzroy and the Board of Trade wanted to formalize meteorology into a modern science. And to this end, Fitzroy established a chain of meteorological stations across the British Isles, all connected to London via the newly invented electric telegraph. And in this way, meteorological observations could be very quickly relayed, analyzed, and distributed. And starting in 1861, regular scientific weather forecasts started being published in the Times of London. And if that wasn't enough, in 1860, Fitzroy introduced the practice of raising a black storm cone over a harbor to warn the fleets within not to sail because foul weather was coming. In 1863, he also published the first modern treatise on meteorology, the Weather Book, or a Practical Manual of Meteorology. And he even coined the term weather forecast. Now, in 1859, the British Isles were lashed by a particularly violent storm that wrecked 133 ships and badly damaged 90 others. And possibly the most famous victim of this storm was the Royal Charter, which was a schooner carrying a load of gold from Melbourne in Australia to Liverpool, which was wrecked off the coast of Anglesey in Wales with the loss of 450 of her crew and passengers. And in the wake of this disaster, Admiral Fitzroy began distributing various weather forecasting instruments to fishing ports all across the British Isles. And these were typically installed in a stone, metal, or wooden housing placed in a public place, such as a town square or along the harbor front, so that they could be easily accessed and consulted. And these instruments varied from traditional mercury barometers to wet and dry bulb thermometers to weather glasses, just like this one. So the Fitzroy storm glass consists of a glass tube filled with a particular mixture of solvents and solutes. And while the composition varied from manufacturer to manufacturer, according to one recipe found in the Druggist General Receipt Book by Henry Beasley from 1861, the composition was 9 drams of distilled water, 6 drams of ethanol, 2.5 drams of camphor, 38 grains of potassium nitrate, at the time known as nitre or saltpeter, and 38 grains of ammonium chloride, then known as sal ammoniac. Now, since a solid dram is equivalent to 1.771 grams, a fluid dram to 3.551 milliliters, and a grain to 64.798 milligrams, this translates to 33.3 milliliters of water, 22.2 milliliters of ethanol, 4.4 grams of camphor, 2.4 grams of potassium nitrate, and 2.4 grams of ammonium chloride or, respectively, 56%, 29%, 7%, 4%, and 4% by mass. Now, earlier weather glasses were open to the atmosphere, whereas later models, and indeed all the examples you can purchase today as curiosities, are sealed. And this is mainly so that the solvents inside won't evaporate away, you don't have to top them up, and also because the smell of the camphor and alcohol in here is very pungent. 
Now, in his weather book, Fitzroy describes the interpretation of the storm glass as such. If fixed, undisturbed, in free air, not exposed to radiation, fire, or sun, but in the ordinary light of a well-ventilated room or outer air, the chemical mixture in a so-called storm glass varies in character with the direction of the wind, not its force, especially, though it may so vary in appearance only, from another cause, electrical tension. As the atmospheric current veers towards, comes from, or is approaching only from the polar direction, this chemical mixture, microscopically washed, grows like fir or fern leaves, hoarfrost, or crystallizations. As it tends to the opposite quarter, the lines or spikes, all regular hard and crisp features, gradually vanish. Before, and in a continued southerly wind, the mixture sinks gradually downwards in the vial till it becomes shapeless like melted sugar. Before or during the continuance of a northerly wind, polar current, the crystallizations are beautiful, if the mixture is correct, the glass a fixture, and duly placed. The least motion of the liquid disturbs them. While any hard or crisp features are visible below, above, or at the top of the liquid, where they form for much north wind, there is plus electricity in the air, a mixture of polar current coexisting in that locality with the opposite southerly. When nothing but soft, melting, sugary substance is seen, the atmospheric current, feeble or strong as it may be, is southerly, unmixed with, and uninfluenced by the contrary wind. By repeated trials with a delicate galvanometer applied to measure electrical tension in the air, I have proved these facts and now find them useful for aiding with the barometer and thermometer in forecasting weather. Temperature affects the mixture much, but not solely, as many comparisons of winter with summer changes of temperature have fully demonstrated. Now that seems rather convoluted, never fear, because those instructions are typically translated as If the fluid is clear, the weather will be bright and clear. If the fluid is cloudy, then the weather will be cloudy, perhaps with precipitation. If there are small spots in the fluid, the weather will be humid or foggy. If the fluid is cloudy with small spots, there will be thunderstorms. If there are small flakes in the fluid, there will be snow. If there are large flakes in the fluid, it will be overcast in the summer and snowy in the winter. If there are crystals at the bottom of the glass, there will be frost. And if there are fine threads near the top of the glass, it will be windy. So now we come to the million dollar question, which is, how does the storm glass actually work? How do the atmospheric changes that precede these various meteorological phenomena affect the precipitation and crystallization of these solutes in a sealed tube of liquid? Well, as you've probably guessed, they really don't. And it didn't actually take scientists very long to figure this out. Indeed, just a few years after Admiral Fitzroy introduced the storm glasses into widespread use, a scientist named Charles Tomlinson conducted an extensive investigation as to the workings of the storm glass, the results of which were published in the July to December issue of the London, Edinburgh, and Dublin Philosophical Magazine and Journal of Science. So in the course of his investigation, Tomlinson conducted a number of experiments, including the most obvious one, which was simply to observe the crystallization phenomena within the storm glass and compare these to the weather over the next few days. And he, along with other scientists who have studied this instrument in more recent years, concluded that the chances of the storm glass accurately predicting the weather were no greater than 50%. That is, no better than chance. And he writes in his report, I have been in the habit of observing this instrument for some years past and had long ceased to regard it as of any value as a weather predictor, but suppose the various phenomena to be brought about by the action of heat and light. While engaged, however, in investigating the phenomena which accompany the motion of camphor towards the light, I was led to attend more minutely to the storm glass and arrived at the conclusion that heat is the only agent concerned, although the phenomena may be complicated somewhat by the composition of the mixture and the repeated crystallizations and solutions of the ingredients. For example, nitre, which is freely soluble in water, is insoluble in alcohol, the addition of which throws down a portion of the salt from its aqueous solution. Camphor, on the other hand, is freely soluble in alcohol, and very sparingly so in water, so that the addition of water to camphorated spirit precipitates camphor. The mixture is so composed that a portion of the solid is always precipitated and that the effect of a rise in temperature is to take up more of the solid, and of a fall in temperature to precipitate it. And indeed, in one of his experiments, Tomlinson heated up the contents of the storm glass until all the solutes were fully dissolved and the fluid was clear, and then he left it by a cold window. And I decided to do this myself to see what would happen, and it lines up exactly with what he reported, which was that little crystals like snowflakes would start to materialize from the top of the fluid and slowly rain down and accumulate at the bottom. Now, in his report, he describes how these crystals would form preferentially on the cold side of the glass, that is, the side closest to the window, and thus 
the pile at the bottom would form a slope because the crystals would drop only down one side of the glass. In my setup, there really wasn't a cold or hot side of the glass, although I suspect that there was some sort of impurity or imperfection in the glass near the top that acted as a nucleation site where the crystals would form, detach, and fall to the bottom. Now, another experiment that Tomlinson conducted was to compare the behavior of the weather glass when it was exposed to atmosphere versus when it was sealed. And he found that when it was exposed to atmosphere, a crust of crystals formed very quickly on the top surface. But when the glass was sealed, this phenomenon was greatly reduced. And this makes sense because when the glass is open to atmosphere, the solvent is going to evaporate, which will cause a lot more precipitation than when it is sealed. He also tried to isolate the different solutes in the solvent. So, for example, mixing together only water, ethanol, and ammonium chloride, or water, ethanol, and camphor. And he found that the tiny little crystals that rain down are mainly composed of camphor, whereas those very delicate fern-like crystals that hang down from the surface of the liquid are mainly ammonium chloride. So all of these experiments and observations confirm Tomlinson's hypothesis that the only driving force behind the crystallization phenomena within the storm glass was temperature. And at the end of his report, he concludes that, I think it may be fairly concluded from these experiments and observations that the storm glass acts as a rude kind of thermoscope, inferior, for most purposes of observation, to the thermometer. However, you can kind of see how the crystallization phenomena inside the storm glass might roughly correlate with atmospheric conditions through the mechanism of temperature. So for example, if it's a fine summer day and it starts to cool down a little bit, you might indeed get fog. And at the same time, this is going to cool down the fluid inside this glass and cause some of the solute to precipitate out. So the fluid will go cloudy. The same goes for the drop in temperature that accompanies an advancing storm front, snow, frost, etc. And if you leave this out on a windy day, the wind is going to cool down the fluid and cause more of the crystals to come out. Though, as a weather prediction instrument, I don't really see how useful this would be, since you could just walk outside and see that it's windy. So before we end this video, I think it's worth briefly touching upon one of the fantastic devices that was in direct competition with the Fitzroy storm glass. And this was the Tempest Prognosticator, which was invented in 1850 by one Dr. George Merriweather, who was an honorary curator of the Whitby Literary and Philosophical Society Museum. And this device was based on, and I'm not making this up here, leeches. So it has long been observed that when foul weather is imminent, leeches will seek higher ground. And so Merriweather's contraption consisted of 12 glass bottles, each containing rainwater and one leech, connected to metal tubes, which were in turn connected to a mechanism that would cause a small hammer to strike a central bell. The idea being that when foul weather was anticipated, the leeches would climb up out of their bottles and into the tubes and strike the bell. And the more leeches struck the bell, the greater the chances that a storm was approaching. So this rather bizarre device was exhibited at the Great Exhibition of 1851 at Crystal Palace, and Merriweather lobbied hard to have the government adopt his innovation as their official weather forecasting instrument, though they eventually decided that the Fitzroy storm glass and barometers and other instruments were a lot cheaper and easier to build and maintain. And so the prognosticator became no more than a very eccentric footnote in the history of meteorology. So if you want, today you can buy your very own Fitzroy Storm Glass as a desktop toy or curiosity. I picked this one up at a toy store for about $30. And while it might not predict the weather, it still makes for a great conversation piece. And I think this is a fascinating artifact from a transitionary period where we were really trying to go from folk methods to proper science and ended up making a bunch of false steps along the way. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time in another episode where we'll look at yet more fascinating instruments and other devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.